Thank you very much. You know, that is a song that would be well for us to memorize. Especially as we come to the end of days and we've been talking about the seven last plagues. What a better song to sing that reminds us that God watches over us. If He watches over the birds, over the sparrows, He has even said Himself, I feed them. Would I love you even much less? He loves us even much more. Even much more. Thank you very much for that song. We are looking now in Revelation chapter 16, the sixth plague, which is the battle of Armageddon. Which is, as we're going to see, nothing how the media advertises the battle of Armageddon to be. Or even some modern scholars as well. But as a review, we've looked at the first five plagues. Uh, from the past, past to Sabbath, we've looked at the first five plagues. And the first plague we see there in Revelation 16 are, are what? There's sores and boils that come upon those who have the mark of the beast. That's very important to remember. And just as the, re as the review, we use the platform as a timeline here, the piano being when the Sunday law is enforced, when the mark of the beast is enforced, the pulpit being when the plagues begin, and the organ representing the second coming of Jesus. We don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know when this is going to happen. And we don't know when that is going to happen. Although we can see signs of this happening or getting closer. And it'll probably be advertised. But we, know, we, we don't know when the seven life plagues are going to fall. And why is that? Because God wants us to be prepared every day. Every day as if, as if it is our last day. Because we don't know. We could be living during this time and think, Oh, we have a long time before the plagues fall. Only God knows. Only God knows. So the first plague there is the boils and sores that come upon those who have the mark of the beast. But yet those who don't do not have any physical affliction. The first plague is a physical affliction that comes on them. And yet God's promise is, you follow me and you will not have any physical affliction. You will not have any physical affliction. The, the, the second plague is the seas turning to blood and how it affects the economics and the economy. And if you remember, their way to promote the mark was if you don't get the mark, you can't buy or sell. But when the, blood, when the oceans turn to blood and there's problems in shipping and problems in, with oil, it will be even hard then to buy and sell as well. But our economic security is in Christ and Christ will provide everything that we need. Everything that we need. The third plague we, we looked at also being the rivers turning to blood. The devil wanted to persecute but praise the Lord, once the plagues begin, no more, there will not be any more Christian martyrs. God will not allow, once the plagues begin, from this time onward, God will not allow His beloved, faithful children to be harmed physically or killed by the devil. Amen. 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 The reason why God may allow it in this previous time is because it could win still a soul who is undecided. Just, just, just how Stephen's martyrdom was, was a tool to convert Saul. And so the fourth plague we see that the sun scorches on the earth. It scorches on the people. And that which has been the object of worship. That which has been the object of worship. Has now scorching men. And since, since the beginning of, 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 of history with Egyptians, Babylonians, Romans, pagans. Sun worship has been, has been the main worship. And so during this time, as they, as they set their mark on, the, on worshiping on the day of the sun, God brings this fourth plague, scorching them. And by this time, on the fifth plague, you see the people, the people buy into, 
Let's all come together and worship, and if we have to enforce it, let's enforce it. But when they see these plagues falling upon them, who do you think they're going to turn to for help? Or turn to and say, hey, what's the problem on who they trusted from the beginning? Who the light was in bringing this unity and bringing this, this one day of worship, this mark of authority. But when they turn to, the, to those religious powers, the Bible says here in Revelation 16, verse 10, Then the fifth angel poured out his bow on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. They will not find light. They will not find any answers. They will not be able to deliver. So now we continue with the sixth plague. Here in Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 through 14. The Bible says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great rivers Euphrates, and its waters was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out from the kings of the, e of the, of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. One thing that we can notice here is that this six plagues has kind of has kind of two parts. You see there that it deals with the river Euphrates and drying up of that river and in, in preparing for the kings of the east. And then it also deals with frogs and unclean spirits. It deals with those two, those two parts. But this is a strange plague, wouldn't you say? A river Euphrates dried up, three frogs or unclean spirits. What is it talking about? Is the sixth plague a literal plague or a symbolic plague? Okay? If we say that, that it is a literal plague and that the real, lit then we have to say that the river Euphrates, we know, exists. If we say that this plague is a literal plague, then that means that the frogs have to be literal frogs. And the beast has to be a literal beast. Okay, and the, king, and the kings from the east have to be literal kings. But you, we can see here, by the language of this sixth plague, that it is a symbolic language. It is symbolic language. Otherwise, the frogs or the beast or the, the frogs coming out of the beast's mouth would all, would all have to be literal if we're going to take it literal. So here we can see that the sixth plague is a symbolic language. And also because if we look at Great Controversy, page 628. Oh wow, they look darker than what I thought. It says these plagues, talking about the seven last plagues, these plagues are not universal or the inhabitants of the earth would be wholly cut off, yet they will be the most awful scores that have ever been known to mortals. All the judgment upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading, the pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measures of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. But notice, these plagues are not universal. And then it describes why? Because it would kill everybody. Does that mean that they're literal plagues? Yes. Is there going to be literal blood in the, in the ocean? Yes. There's going to be literal sores on people's bodies? Yes. Literal darkness? Literal blood in the rivers? Literal sun scorching on people? Yes, it will. But here we're told that it's not going to be simultaneously universe, universal because then everyone will die. So looking at the six plagues here, what do we see first in verse 12 of Revelation 16? We see there talking about the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates. What what do we know about the river Euphrates? Well, we know that it ran through Babylon. 
It was the life support of Babylon. It was where, where Babylon got their water. If you, if you remember, uh, I remember in school study on how Babylon used to be one of the seven wonders of the world because of its what? Hanging gardens. Hanging gardens. And, and, and Babylon is, is in the desert. How do you have that water? Well, the river Euphrates supplied the water for the hanging gardens. The river Euphrates supplied the water for their, for their crops. The river Euphrates supplied their water just for, their, for life. It was the life support to Babylon. You can even say that Babylon sat on many waters. Now, was that river ever dried up? Yes, it was. It was dried up in 539 BC. 539 BC by Cyrus. If you open your Bibles to Isaiah 44, this was even prophesied way before the times of Daniel. In Isaiah chapter 44, Isaiah chapter 44, if we can turn on the lights just a little bit, I can't read my Bible. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 44, here it is prophesied that Cyrus would come and conquer and dry up the rivers. Isaiah 44 verse 28, it says, who, say, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, thank you, and he shall perform all my pleasures, even saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. 45 verse 1, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. Here Cyrus has been anointed and prepared excuse me, way before for God to use to conquer Babylon. You see, Cyrus was the one through, through, the, through, the, through the decree of Artaxerxes that let God's people in Babylon free to go back to Jerusalem. That's why it says here, you will go back and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Cyrus dried up that river there in conquering Babylon. If you're familiar with the stories, Babylon was a great city. It's high walls and thick walls and they felt so secure inside Babylon. They had enough water supply, the river just ran right through there. They had enough food. But when the Medes and the Persians came wanting to conquer, they couldn't just walk in, they couldn't just knock down the walls. And for several months, they dug trenches to divert the water that went through the city. And once the water dried down, the soldiers went in and in one night, Babylon was conquered. In one night. So the rivers were dried up when we, when we look at the actual river Euphrates there. And Cyrus is a king of the east that dried up that river. Cyrus came from the east to dry up the river Euphrates and overthrow Babylon and send God's people free under, the, under the, the decree of Artaxerxes. So Israel goes free and rebuilds Jerusalem. So if we turn back to Revelation, Revelation 16 here, it says here that this sixth angel, this sixth plague will dry up the river Euphrates and its waters will dry up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. What do waters represent in Bible prophecy? Peoples, nations, tongues. The Euphrates River was the main support for Babylon. It was the main support. It was what gave it life. What is it that gives life to the mark of the beast? What is it that gives life to this one day, this, this unity, this, this day of worship. Where does it come from? It comes from the people. It comes from the people. Great Controversy, page 592, says, The pleading blood... I'm sorry, I, there you go. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by will be supplied by 
oppressive enactments. Thank you. Political corruption is destroying love and justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, notice that, in order to secure public favors, will yield to the popular demand for the law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has caused so great, and, and it has a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. Where does this National Sunday Law come from? Who calls it? Who wants it? Is it Washington that's pushing it? No. Washington yields to the demand of what? Of the people. Of the people. You see, while we are here enjoying this Sabbath day, all, there are many signs that are being fulfilled. Many signs. While we're entertained with, what, with what's happening with, with the presidential debates and maybe the World Series, there are people still suffering from the, from the signs of the world are happening. Has anyone, you know, my father and I were, were just discussing this a couple of days ago, where there was a time where people, a couple, a, a couple of days ago, we were all worried about the hurricane in Mexico. And now, are we still worried about that? Or are we on to the next news? Well, those people are still suffering. Those people are still in affliction from that. We were looking at just the earthquakes that happen every day and high earthquakes. Not, not, not little, little earthquakes, high earthquakes. Every single day, hundreds of earthquakes around the world. While all these signs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the people, especially here, because we know that Revelation 13, it will begin in the United States, the people will say, we have fallen from God's grace and we need to come back to God. So we need to enforce, we need to come and all unite together in worship in one day. And that's when this happens. National Sunday Law begins. They will call, they will appeal to political governors, to the government, to the legislators of the law. You need to make this mandatory. People need to turn back to God whether they want to or not. Has that, has that happened recently? Something similar has. Let's take for, for instance the, the decision of same-sex marriage, that, which is now legal in the United States of America. Did that come from Washington? Did, was Washington pushing that? Or was it the people and Washington gave in to that? Washington in the same way yielded to the popular demand for what the people wanted. It's, gonna, it's, it's happened already with this issue of same-sex marriage. So don't think that it won't happen again if they want to just enforce a day of worship and of course politicians politicians all they want to do is what please the people please the people so they will yield to popular demands for a law according for a, a law enforcing Sunday observance when they see these plagues poured out on them when they see these plagues poured out on them then like the rivers Euphrates that was dried up and the river Euphrates was the support system of Babylon. The, the support system of, of Babylon was dried up there by Cyrus. When these people see that the plagues are affecting them and they see that who they trusted in coming in unity is not really delivering, their support system will be dried up, will, will be gone. No longer will they support the beast or this religious authority who recommended and pushed also for this National Sunday Law. You see, Cyrus, the king of the east, overthrows Babylon. And so at the end, when they pass a decree of, and promise peace and prosperity, but when, they, but when they see that the only thing that they are getting are plagues, they lose trust and support. In, in whom they first supported and believed. You see, they will say to the beast power, you told us if we take your mark that we would have physical security, but we don't. We have boils and they're not being cured. You told us that we would have economic security, but we can't look at the oceans. 
They're full of blood. You told us if we worshiped on your day, but look what the sun is scorching us with heat. And they turn to follow to look for answers, but there they, they just find darkness. You said, but you don't deliver. And they begin to lose the support and not support the beast system anymore. And the, and, the, and the support to the beast will be gone. The rivers is dried up to prepare the kings of the east. And just as Cyrus, just, just as Cyrus came and delivered Bab and delivered, I'm sorry, Israel out of Babylon and back to Jerusalem, so God will come and deliver his people. Jesus will come and deliver God and, and will deliver his people. From the east. Matthew 24, 27 says, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. One of my favorite quotes here from Great Controversy, page 640. Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud about half the size of a man's hand. It is the cloud which surrounding the Savior. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. In solemn silence they gaze upon it as it draws near to the earth, becoming lighter and more glorious until it is a great white cloud, it, its base a glory like consuming fire, and above it the rainbow of the covenant, Jesus riding forth as a mighty conqueror. Amen. Amen. Jesus coming from the east. For what? For you and for me. Jesus coming from the east with his angels, all of heaven, hallelujah. hallelujah, will be empty coming from the east to come and pick up, to come and deliver you and me. There had just how Cyrus came from the east, dried up the waters, conquered Babylon, and with a decree of Artaxerxes, he says, you Jews can go back to, your, to Jerusalem, rebuild it, rebuild your temple. But we're not going to go back to Jerusalem. We're going to go back to the new Jerusalem Amen. in heaven that God has prepared for us. The support system dries up because man can't deliver what they promised. And that prepares the way for God to come. So what does the devil do once he knows that there's no more support to the beast? Then he goes to the most extreme and desperate. Notice there with Revelation 16 verse 13 and 14. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets for they are spirits of demons. And what are they doing? Performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and on the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now the devil gets desperate and what does he do? He, plur he, he begins to do great signs and wonders. And notice here, it is comparing it to three unclean spirits like frogs. If you remember the plagues of the frogs in Egypt, how many frogs were there? We don't know. There were millions of frogs. The Bible says there that there were frogs everywhere, everywhere, in your bedroom, in your nightstand, in your closet, in your kitchen, in your pantry, in your bowls, everywhere there was a frog. In your bathroom, can you imagine the frogs, frogs in the toilet? Can you even go to the bathroom comfortable? No. How many of you like frogs? Just a few hands. I have, I, have, I have a lovely wife who just by looking at a little frog like this is enough for her to jump on a chair and stay there until the frog leaves or I shoo it away. Can you imagine, just imagine thousands of frogs everywhere. Even if you like frogs, you can't even walk without probably even stepping on a frog or eat. You know, you pour your cereal and the frogs come out. <laughs> Friends, this was the plague in Egypt. This was the plague in Egypt. Frogs was everywhere, even sleeping in your, in your sheets. No, 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 no. 
And here, these frogs, just like in Egypt, they're everywhere. Here in the six plagues, these unclean spirits, these, these signs, these miracles will be everywhere. Everywhere. The devil will be so desperate because the, the, the support to the beast is gone. The people will say, we trusted you, but you don't deliver. We're scorched with all these plagues while those people hiding out there have nothing. And so the devil then performs great signs and wonders and even goes to the utmost in, one, in impersonating Jesus Christ. In impersonating Jesus Christ. And that should not be new because of Revelation 13, 13. Revelation 13, 13, here talking about the devil and this second beast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Can you imagine somebody coming and, you know, and actually bringing f real fire from heaven? Here, the devil does supernatural manifestations. These unclean spirits, these frogs of, of performing signs are supernatural manifestations. And this is the work of the devil. As Satan is losing control, his last attempt will be to impersonate Christ. And here from Review and Herald, October 4th, 1894, when the conflict is not yet ended, and as we draw near the close of time, the battle waxes more intense as the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ draws near. Satanic, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Notice here, Satan will not only appear as human beings, not only that, but what? But will impersonate Jesus Christ. And the world who has rejected the truth will receive him as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He will exercise his power and work upon the human imaginations. It's interesting choice of words that she used. Satan will work his power upon the human's imagination. That's why Christians, that's why we as Seventh-day Adventists, as Bible-believing Christians, do not walk by sight. Do not walk by feelings. Do not walk by our imaginations. But we walk by what God says in His Word. You see, the devil, the devil will go so far that he will impersonate my grandfather and bring him to me dressed in his suit how I always saw him and come to me and say Harley you know heaven is fine you need to trust me and what should I do what is he messing with my imagination impersonating somebody who is sleeping in Jesus but we don't walk by sight no 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 we walk by what thus says the Lord. Amen. And in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, Satan, get out. Amen. That's what you do. And the spirit will leave. The demon spirit will leave. Because the Bible is clear that the dead sleep and the dead do not know. The dead do not worship. And so here the devil will go so far as to impersonate and bring people and relatives that you know because he he's knows his time is even more shorter and he goes out to impersonate even Jesus and make signs and wonders. That's why 2 Corinthians, turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the Bible is clear. You may be thinking, wait a minute, where did she get that idea that Satan would impersonate? Well, the, the same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul inspired her. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. 14. So friends, if somebody may come to you who you know has passed away, do not believe that they are that person. Satan is trying to deceive you in thinking they are. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 and says, And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of what? Into an angel of light. 
You see, the devil has done a good job in thinking that for people to look for the devil, he needs to be in red with a horns and a tail and a fork and looking evil and mean and dark. If an angel of light appears to you, would the world think, oh, that's Satan? No, what would they think? That's an angel from heaven coming to give me a message. Oh, it's my grandmother. Oh, it's my late husband or my wife or my mother or father. Or maybe it's Paul. You don't think the devil will impersonate and his angels, even some of the apostles? Why not? Coming, can you imagine people thinking, you know, Paul the Apostle has, has come down to visit us and he, and he has a message for us. I can guarantee you, Christendom will be there listening to what that demon has to say. And so here it says, the devil himself will, will transform himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing in if his ministers, who are the, the devil's ministers? Who are the devil's ministers? The evil angels. The other one-third angels that fell with him also, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their work. Notice, they transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. They're not going to come back as Hitler, maybe. <laughs> Nobody likes Hitler. They're not going to come back as somebody who did evil in the world, but somebody who did good, who was righteous. Satan's last attempt, last attempt, is to deceive with miracles and supernatural manifestation. And that's why I plead with every single person here, especially our young people, have nothing to do with supernatural things. Amen. Have nothing to do. Not even be curious. Just a little curiosity. You know they say curiosity killed the cat? Curiosity can kill your soul. Curiosity will take you to the lake of fire. The devil just needs a little crack that you're curious and he'll kick the door open and in he comes. And then you'll be calling, Pastor, I'm hearing things in my room. Things are, strange things are happening. Have nothing to do with supernatural manifestations, supernatural things. Have nothing to do with what the world does tonight. Amen. Amen. The devil has one last final attempt through false miracles, signs, and wonders. And then comes Revelation 16, 16. Then comes Revelation 16, 16. It says, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, why would the Bible say called in Hebrew Armageddon? The Bible was written in Greek, not in Hebrew. You see, the Hebrew word for Armageddon is Har Megiddo. I normally don't, don't mention Greek or Hebrew's manners on a sermon, but here, because the Bible says that it's called in Hebrew Armageddon, it's good to know the Hebrew word, the, the Hebrew root, I'm sorry, of Armageddon, which is Har Megiddo, Har meaning mountain and Megiddo meaning slaughter. A mountain of slaughter. And if you join with me to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 4, there is a valley of Megiddo which exists. Even today you can go visit it. You can Google pictures of Megiddo. Now they've built cities, they build towns around it. But during Bible times, Megiddo was a place where many battles were fought. Many battles were fought because it was, it was right at the crossroads between north and south of Israel. Megiddo was right at the crossroads there. And in Judges chapter 4, there is a battle there at Megiddo. There are many battles, but in this one, it is, it is, it is, it is a very unique one because God's people are in desperate needs here in Megiddo. This is the story of Deborah. This is a wonderful story, especially if you're a woman. Here, Deborah, God used Deborah as his tool to bring deliverance to his people. 
And God, God was counting on Barak to, to, to take the charge. Israel was surrounded. Israel was surrounded here in Megiddo by all parts around them. Mountains in front of them, all around them. They could not retreat and the enemy was behind them, in front of them, on the right of them, on the left of them. They were surrounded. There was no way out. It appeared that Israel would be devastated or even destroyed. And so they cried to God, help us. And Deborah tells Barak, go fight and God will be with you. But what does is, what is Barak say? If you're not familiar with the story, read, read, read Judges chapter 4 today. Barak says, well, I'll go if you come with me. And, she said, and so she, she says, fine, I'll go with you. But because I'm going to go with you, God's going to give the victory to a woman and not to you. And he does that. And God brings victory and turns the enemies and gives victory to Israel. There in Judges chapter 4 verse 15. What does God do? And the Lord, and the Lord rooted Sisera, Sisera. And the Lord rooted Sisera. Sisera was the enemy. And all his chariots and, on, and, 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 his, and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera aligned from his chariot and fled away on foot. And he thought he, he got away, but when you read the rest of the story, it's just awesome. Sisera goes to a tent and looks for shelter and tells, and tells, tells in, verse, verse, in verse 18, tells, tells Jael, she's there in her tent, and, and he comes in and says, can you just hide me here? Okay, and he hides under the, a sheet, under a, a cover there. But he first asks for water, and she gives him milk. And then while he's pretending to be hiding, she gets a, a steak tent. You know what you know, a steak is you know, for the tents? And I'm sure they were a lot bigger than what we have today. And so the Bible says that she put it against his temple and struck it. You know the, you know, the, the temple on the side of your... And the, what... <laughs> Can you imagine, I'm sure even, even the angel helped here, here with the blow. Because the Bible says that the blow went through the head and into the ground. Did God give victory? He did. And God fulfilled even what Deborah was saying, that he was going to give victory to the woman and not to you because you had no faith. But here, God gave victory to the, to the children of Israel in Megiddo. And notice Judges chapter 5. Now, now Judges chapter 5 is again, is again the reencount of a battle here in Megiddo. And my Bible here has little, little headings. It says, the song of Deborah. This, this is a song of victory. You know, just how when Israel crossed the Red Sea, what did they, what did they do after they crossed the Red Sea? The song of Miriam, the Bible says, right? They sang praises to God because God gave them victory. God delivered them and, and the Egyptians were drowned. And so this is the song of victory. The song of victory here in Judges chapter 5 and it describes on how God delivered them. In verse 19, in verse 19 it says, The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Notice verse 22. Then the horses, hoofs, pounded. The galloping, galloping of his steeds. And then notice verse 23. Curse Meraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to the help of the Lord. To, to the help of the Lord against the mighty against the mighty you see Miraz was not involved here and could have helped Israel could have helped them but they did not but they did not help so God brought reinforcements reinforcements by the waters of Megiddo there in verse 20 they fought from the heavens the stars from their courses fought against Sisera in the valley of Megiddo 
When death seemed certain, when Israel seemed that, they, that it was it, they were surrounded. When death seemed certain and all hope was cut off, God did the impossible and delivered them. And delivered them. Megiddo became a symbol of victory, a symbol of deliverance. A symbol of deliverance here for Israel. God delivered them and helped them from the waters there is of Megiddo and fought from the heavens. Who is in the heavens? It's God and His angels. God interceded and gave them reinforcement and still delivered His people. What is the battle of Armageddon? At the end of the sixth plague, at the end of the sixth plague, when it appears there is no hope for God's people. When there is no hope for God's people. When Satan has his last attempt by working miracles and impersonating Christ. Can you imagine? He's going to impersonate Christ and even some of the disciples. If the so-called Jesus were to tell the people, those people out there that are hiding and say that they're worshiping the, the, the true God, are not really worshiping the true God. I am here. We need to eradicate them. How do you think we who are in the mountains or hiding are going to feel that even people who falsely believe a false Christ, not, not, not only do we have just the, uh, the attack of the people because they're receiving the plagues, but even the people who think that Jesus is, is telling them, we need to eradicate those people, get rid of those people that are out there who have not suffering from these plagues. If we get rid of them, then these plagues might go away. I'm not sure what, set, what the devil is going to use, but in the six plagues, when it appears that there is no hope, that God's people have no deliverer. When Satan uses his last attempt by working miracles, what does God do here? And here in Judges 5.20, the Bible says, they fought from the heavens, the stars, from the course, from their courses fought against Israel. So God's people will also be delivered. And when it seems that there is no hope, then Revelation 16 verse 17 begins, which says, Then the seventh angel, the, the seventh plague, poured out his bowl into the air, and, the, and a loud voice came from the temple of heaven. What did that loud voice say? It's done. It is done. And there was noises and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as such a mighty and great earthquake as had not encountered since men on the earth and it, it talks about on how the islands were divided and the, and the islands fled away and and hails great hails verse 21 and great hail from heaven fell upon men every hailstorm every hailstorm about the weight of a talent and men blaspheme God because of the plagues of the hail since the plague was exceedingly great. Friends, when it seems that there is no hope, that hope is gone, that Satan is winning, even with his impersonation of Christ, Christ then brings the final plague, brings the great earthquake and, and he is says it is done, it is enough. It is enough. It is done. He announces from heaven, it is finished. It is finished. So meanwhile, friends, we need to hang in there. Never give up. Christ is coming very soon. And during this time of trouble, during this seven last plagues, which is this time here, it is also referred to by the spirit of prophecy as Jacob's time of trouble. As Jacob, this is a time of trouble, but this here is Jacob's time of trouble. Are you familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau? When Jacob was going back home, going back home with his family, his children, his flock, and everything, and his, and, and his, and his wives, but yet Esau knew he was coming. And Esau has still that what? Resentment of what he had done. And Esau's spirit was still the same, because you robbed me, my inheritance, my blessing, I'm going to kill you. And Esau was out to kill who? Jacob. And what was Jacob's concern? I, I, I invite you to read the story there in Genesis. Jacob's concern was what? For his family. For his family. Because Esau was going to wipe out Jacob and everybody in his, his family. He was so 
full of bitter and anger, even though many years have passed, at least 14 years have passed, because he worked seven years for each woman. Even though all those years have passed, Esau was still bitter and still wanted to kill his brother and his family. And that's why Jacob, he told his family, you wait here, go behind here, and I will come around, and my brother will not take me, at least he'll just kill me, but not kill you. And he prayed that night, all night long, pleading for God to intervene. Lord, have mercy, please and please. It wasn't prayers like our prayers where we pray, Lord, if it be your will for Esau not to kill me, please let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> he was really, really scared for his life, for his wife, for his children. If somebody were to come after your children, and you knew they were coming on such date, and you couldn't escape, you couldn't flee the country, you couldn't go anywhere, and they knew where you lived, even if you move, they, 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 they follow you with the GPS. I don't know, they found you. Would you not plead to God until you knew God would deliver you and your family? And here, Jacob pleaded. And who appeared to him? Jesus came to him. Friends, don't miss that. Amen. During our hardest times, during our times of affliction during our time of trouble God still comes to us Amen. God still comes to us I'm sure Jacob was probably dry from so much crying and pleading to God and repenting and asking God to change Esau's heart and when the angel came to him he didn't know it was an angel he started wrestling he thought it was a thief but when he realized it was God what did he do he held on to him he says, you ain't going anywhere. I need you to have, I need the assurance of what? That I'm going to be safe, my family's going to be safe, that you're going to bless me. And even there, Jesus there, he's like, let go. The sun's coming up. I, got, I need to go. But he was so desperate. He says, no. You guarantee you bless me. When was the last time you've prayed like that? I can tell you I haven't recently. That we plead that we do not get up from our knees until God has given us the assurance that He has, has blessed us. That He will, that he will be with us. And did God did deliver him? Yes, He did. God blessed him and God changed Esau's heart. And when Esau and Jacob met, they embraced and forgave each other. And He, he introduced his family but, he, but Jacob and his family were spared. During that time of trouble, during this time of trouble, God will deliver you. God will deliver you. But here, I purposely left this part to the very end. When it seems, during this battle of Armageddon, which is, which is, which is really a battle to remain faithful, even though we may not see, we may not see God, or, or even though we may not feel that, that, that the Holy Spirit is with us. Remember, the Holy Spirit will be removed. Even though the Holy Spirit will be removed, it doesn't mean we are alone. Jesus says, I will be with you till the end of the world, to the end of age. God will not be interceding anymore because it's done. He's come out of the most holy place. The Holy, the holy Spirit whose work is to convict of our, of, of our sins will be removed. It's done. The Bible says those who will be holy will remain holy. Those who will be unjust will remain unjust. And we will feel as if we are alone without the Holy Spirit. But God says, I will still be with you. And just how I mentioned last Sabbath, Jesus on the cross, did he feel a separation from his Father? <coughs> But yet he trusted in his Father and his words are going to be our words. Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. I give my life into your hands. We may, I may not see you, I may not feel you, but I know that my life is in your hands. And Revelation 6, 16 verse 15, these words are words of Jesus. They're in red. It says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. That means we need to be ready every single day. 
Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. What garments are these? The garments of righteousness, the garments of Jesus Christ. Behold, I'm coming. I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watch and keep his garments. Do not give up your garments. Do not give up your garments. God is coming very soon. Very, very soon. We don't know when it is, but we do know. Once this law is passed, and it is mandatory that we cannot worship how we are here today, friends, that's exciting times. That's ex exciting times and also scary times. Because if you are not grounded in the Word and in God and a relationship with Him, then, friends, forget it. Forget it. It will be easy for us to just give in because we want security. But let's hold on to Jesus Christ. Let's hold on to what His promises say. Seek the Lord every day, the Bible says. Today is a day of salvation. We need to seek Him every day, build a relationship with Him, trust His Word every day, read His Word, study, get, build. Jesus there says in Matthew 7, that many will come to Him. But what did Jesus say? I never knew you. I never knew you. So, during this time of trouble, or even this Jacob's time of trouble, what will keep us safe is having a relationship with Jesus and having our garments of righteousness that He gives you and me. And even though the devil may throw maybe a, a passed away relative or miracles fire from heaven or maybe have somebody walk on water, can, can, can the devil do that? Of course he can. But the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. By their fruits and we test everything by the Holy Word of God. And we will not be deceived and so even though these plagues will be falling down, they are promises of God that He is coming soon. They are promises of God that He will deliver you. He will give you physical security, economic security. He will save your life. He will give you victory, friends. And just as the special music was this morning, that God watches over you and me, I hope that you really do believe that. You really do believe. Because during these hard times, you have to solely depend that God is watching over you. God is taking care of you. We've read before that God will feed us. God will give us our necessities that we need. So we have nothing to fear. Behold, He is coming. And blessed is He who watches and keeps His garments. Blesses he who watches and keeps his garments. Friends, the only way we can lose our garments is the same way Adam and Eve lost their garments. And that is turning away from God and turning to somebody else. So I plead with you. Follow Jesus. Keep his commandments. Hold on to your garments that he gives you every day. And you will be safe during the seven last plagues. God will give you victory during the seven last plagues. God will deliver you during these plagues. And just how our closing hymn says, God will take care of you. Do you believe that? I hope so, friends. You have to believe it. God will take care of you, but you need to spend time with Him and know who He is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord my God, we thank you very much because you have shown us what to expect, what is coming. But Lord, help us, please, not to just sit back and wait for more time before we can get ready. For now, as, as Paul says, now is high time. For the coming of your Son is sooner than what we think. So please be with us as we, every day, not just live our lives and run our errands and do our things, 
But every day we build a better and stronger relationship with you. So that just like your faithful men and women in scripture stood strong and their faith in you, we too may stand strong in, in, our, in our faith with you. And trusting and knowing that you will take care of us. Lord, we long for your coming. And in, in, it is every day that passes is a closer day to it. We're longing to see that small black cloud, Lord. That knows that you are in the midst of that and, you're, and all of your angels coming to rescue us and deliver us when we may think it's hopeless. Thank you, my Lord. Be with your church. Bless your church. And bless your people here. Convict us to have a stronger relationship with you. And Lord, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to save us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.